for sitting in for one more panel today. You're about halfway through, I think. That's a lot of work. Um, I'm really pleased with the density and quality of what people have been presenting. There's so much going on. This one is particularly dear to my heart because I was friends with Bob Moog for a while. Worked together on a few things, or even longer. We'll get into that story as well. Um, but these two characters are very individual and very interesting people with different sets of personalities, different sets of skills. And that also makes for a good collaboration when you can fill in for what the other one cannot do. And they certainly worked together for quite a long time and had a friendship established as well as a working relationship too. So we'll get into that as we go through things. This is the panel. These are our good guests. We have Tom Ray mentioned. Tom was in an earlier panel, uh, briefly mentioned that he is a music historian. He's a teacher of music. He's a uh, really possibly the, the expert on electronic music history that I've ever run into. He certainly knows more about the 20th century evolution of those instruments. Yes, he has a doctorate in that, of course, and a book coming out too, which will be full of amazing instruments, and some Raymond Scott in it as well too. Um, this is Decades of Friendship and Collaboration. Uh, we're going to cover the story of how they first met each other, which goes back much earlier than you might think. The Moog Synthesizer, which we will discuss the creation of, came out in 1964. Certainly a good time period, a good year, but this begins much earlier than that. So Bob was very young, and we're going to go back to New York City. In 1952 and 53 was a Broadway musical called Mrs. McThing. Uh, very popular at the time, and one of the features of it was a hidden instrument offstage. Behind the curtains, behind the scenery, they had a man playing the RCA theremin from 1929. And he would simulate the sound of a ghost, is what they would say. And it would hover around and even pan around the auditorium, sort of an early quadraphonic surround sound idea. Um, and this man was there. Misha Tulin was the performer. As the newspaper article said, he came in from Boston every day. They flew him because of his skills and he, that he owned the rare theremin, even at that period of time, it was an unusual instrument. Flew him to and from Boston every day just to do the musical. <coughs> so, this is our theme beginning. Raymond took his daughter Carrie, who was here tonight, to see this musical, and they were entranced, both of them, by this wonderful instrument. Carrie had talked to us about it, and she's got a clip of film here from Stan's film, Deconstructing Dad, which we're going to show, and she'll explain her part of the story, and this is the genesis of the friendship and collaboration. During this time period, our father's fascination with music and electronics became more relevant for my sister Carrie also. I had gone to see a show called Mrs. McSing on Broadway, and there was a theremin in that, and I was just very, very taken with it. And I wanted one. I wanted a theremin. The fact that you could play a musical instrument like this, and I just thought it was so cool. And I, since I had a pretty good ear, but I couldn't play the right notes and I couldn't read music, I think, well, maybe this would do it. And he said he would make me one. Raymond built her uh, a theremin. I don't think it's a terribly complicated device to build, but apparently it's an extremely difficult device to play. And I tried it for a while and quickly, <laughs> quickly lost interest in it because I really didn't have any musical talent. And then he took it back. Raymond decided to take the concept of the theremin and the sound of a the theremin and devise a, a keyboard apparatus. Which leads us to who else was making theremins at this time? Almost nobody was. There were a few people attempting to replicate that old circuit. But this new uh, idea was to bring it back. Um, Robert Bob Moog was about 20 years old, going to college, but still living with his family in Flushing. And in the basement with his father was building theremins. They also had a nice little business going to demonstrate those and have kids. We think that this is certainly how it reached Ray, thinking about theremins, hoping to do something with it. This is one of their early ads. Of course, in the bottom right, you see popular electronics. So this theremin would pop up in a very unusual place like that, and someone like Ray could be certainly aware of it. And this is a great young picture of Bob around that age. Most people have seen him with lighter colored hair, but this is a nice, beautiful <laughs> shot of him. And obviously, they were very proud of their high-quality instrument. It was beautiful. It was well-designed. It does play well, and again, it was taking the things of the past, bringing them some new life and some new attention, because Bob always considered the theremin a very elegant and powerful design. 
This is that home in Flushing. It's not too big, it's not too small. It's just a nice suburban home, typical American home of the time. And they were invited by this very famous man, Raymond Scott, to come visit. Bob's dad was also an engineer, and they were invited to come out. And it wasn't too far away. It might be a 30-minute drive, if you would say, to where they were living. Yeah. You're from the same neighborhood, same rough area. Yeah. So Herb has been around and, and has lots of the parts of the story, but this house in Flushing, they jumped to the car and they drove to this house, the mansion where the Scots would live, and there were lots of things to discover inside. Bob always talks about it, seeing this wonderful place with this incredible workshop. And most shops don't have a workshop that good. His house had a workshop with this incredible and then, of course, suing a musician, Ray had his studio built in there. There we go. This is, again, the house. You can even see windows in there. This is not quite the full-on studio design, but a home, windows in the back. And it was more advanced than Les Paul and other people at the time had. It really was impressive to someone like Bob and his dad. They just thought it was such a dream world to enter this place. And Ray, of course, was very fascinated with electronics, doing his own things, and, and Bob certainly had begun to get into that world, doing some simple things like organ kits and the theremins. One of the things I'm told that was most impressive to Bob was build quality and presentation. The way Ray did this beautiful thing, it always looks cool. He's not a sloppy designer. He wants things to look professional and impressive. And I think that might have rubbed off on Bob, although he was already doing nice instruments, but really said he was impressed by the way that Ray presented things, and that's an interesting influence. It may take a bit of time to read through this, but this is a bit of a quote from them going through this all the time. Bob's specific memory, which he recounted in several interviews, was they stood in this room, Ray pushed the sequencer start, which activated a bunch of relays, and the relays are electronic switches that move. But he said the clicking and clacking was just as loud as the music, and everyone who was ever in that room said the same thing. It was distracting, it was... So, but again, it's not going to go down on tape that way or onto disc, but in the room itself, it was a mechanical, switchy, noisy thing, right? I was just discussing someone, uh, the, the famous story is that at that point, he said, I'd like to buy one of your therapists, would like to buy this from you. I suspect it's maybe more true from this advertisement. Uh, he ran quite a few in music magazines at the time, electronics magazines, and Bob was also selling kits. One of his ideas in life was to make kits for people to build themselves. And DIY was a really happening thing back then. Ray, of course, was accomplished enough to work on things. And I have one interview where Bob says uh, he bought the parts of a theremin from us. And every other interview says he bought a theremin from us. So I think, to simplify, he would say theremin to most humans. But in this case, the parts is all Ray really needed to do something. He makes a new instrument based on the theremin. And it is here. Clavy, meaning keyboard, and Vox, meaning voice, created his instrument, the Clavivox, which we will talk about. You may have seen these photos, some versions of them. This is that instrument, and he presented it to Bob and his father a few months later. They just said, well, what have you done with that? And he built this instrument to play the theremin circuitry, instead of moving your hand in and out of the field of an antenna, to use a keyboard to control it. You guys want to weigh in on that idea? Well, yes, uh, a little bit I can weigh in on, uh, on the, uh, the, the effect that the uh, first probably well-known use of the theremin was, uh, was with the uh, rock band... Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, not boy. Uh, oh, Beach Boys. No, Beach Boys. Uh, and uh, and uh, that, that uh, theremin actually <coughs> did work on to maintain <coughs> the, uh, in the tonality correctly. So that it wasn't really a pure theremin, uh, but uh, we, a ribbon controller, right? There was, a, there was a. I'm not sure if that instrument used a ribbon controller, but, but I would assume it may have. It would have made it's sense. It's, it's, it's one of the myths of the world that there's actually theremin on the Beach Boys. Even they didn't use a theremin because it's it's rather difficult to play. If you've ever tried it, you should try to articulate very clearly some notes, and it's very difficult. Yes, the theremin. The theremin is. Uh, you know, when uh, when Thurman came to this country and began to talk about uh, about the instrument being sold, uh, the, he did uh, maintain some uh, some uh, interesting uh, uh, relationship with RCA, 
and they built, they did build the theremin and advertised it as the e easiest instrument in the world <laughs> because it has no keyboard or anything you have to learn. It's almost and, as easy as violin. And, yeah. of course, <laughs> and of course, there's no keyboard. No, it is without doubt the hardest instrument in the world to play. Yeah, part of the world. It's easy to make So the concept was to do something unique, and then what's really important to point out about this, there were certainly organs before, there were electronic keyboards, but his idea was to glide between notes. Now, don't forget, this is 10 years before Bob Moog created his first Moog synthesizer. So, to glide between notes was not possible on a piano, not possible on an organ. You could do it on other stringed instruments, but not on a keyboard. So he invented something that is quite practical, which is a system to glide between notes on the keyboard, and it was mechanical. Behind the keys would be just a long lever, and certain keys had adjustments to make the lever go higher or lower depending on the pitch. So it's fairly straightforward, and you can actually physically control it. If you lean very slowly, it can glide very slowly. If you go very quickly, it can slide quickly, but it always slides between notes. That's a limitation as well as a feature. And if, if I remember correctly, that's achieved via a photoelectric. That's so, that the second one. Oh. First one well, there's, it's true, there's a version of it which we will you know, talk about with some things, but it, it is an interesting idea because at some time you've solved one problem, you've always got to glide. It's great for certain kinds of music and certain kinds of dramatic things. And, and I, uh, I think that this was one of his ideas was, what can we make that's new? What can we make that I can use as a functioning keyboard player that gets me into this world of electronics that also mirrors a voice, which is very powerful thing. <coughs> More pictures of it, he was obviously very proud of this. And if you look closely as we zoom in, notice the control panel just kind of basically checking out the features of it because the next photo, it suddenly looks quite different. There's a Model 2, which I will call it here, which hasn't been spotted very much before, but it's the similar kind of instrument with different control panel. And I don't know, no one seems to know which one is exactly the first one. This one looks more primitive and more like a based on Bob Moe's theremin concept to me. But the photos are dated later. Ray has really long hair in this picture, of course. Look how long his hair is. So it's a little bit later in time, but certainly the old instrument could have been around if this is indeed the first one. We just don't know. I'm going to play you a bit of this uh, phone call. Ray was good at recording things. Uh, probably just for detail work and to have a record of conversations where he could say quite a few things. But uh, just a sample of them in December 1964, timing-wise. Herb and, and Bob had begun working together. Just to be sure, by December of 1964. Um, and Bob and I uh, actually met in um, December 1963. And at that time, he was selling his kit therapies. And that's the only instrument that he was making and actually selling. And, uh, and uh, he was uh, selling them at the, uh, the, the New York State, all state, you know, New York State is a big all-state educational organization, and they, they he decided that might be a place to sell theremins. I, I don't know if he sold any theremins at all. And can you but describe the situation? Because you had a theremin I, of his. I, well, the, I, I had already bought a, 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 a theremin of his because I read the article uh, that you, uh, we just mentioned. Uh, what was the name of the magazine? Popular Electronics. Popular Electronics. And, and um, I did read that article, I didn't know who that person was, and I did call up the phone number, and I did what probably everyone else has done, ask for Bob Moog. And, <laughs> and I got Shirley on the phone, and so the first thing she did was correct my <laughs> pronunciation of the name. And then we talked a little bit about it, and, and then I did buy a, a kit uh, theremin, and, um, and built it. But from the contact, you decided that you had more needs beyond therapy. Oh, yes. When, when Bob and I started talking that evening, uh, the, the first word I used, literally, was, what about a music synthesizer? Actually, I remember using that term, and Bob said, well, RCA already uses that name. Well, <laughs> what, they, what he was talking about is the, uh, an instrument in Columbia, which was put together by Columbia University in Princeton, which is called the Columbia Princeton Music Synthesizer, which was not an instrument, a, a pure, pure instrument. It was an entire room full of electronics, and that's what he. That's but they did refer to that as the Columbia Princeton Synthesizer, uh, but 
uh, Bob and I took that night. No one else came in, or if they did, I don't remember it, and Bob never remembered it. All we did was talk about the idea of building an instrument that could be owned by a, a single musician, or by a music school very easily, or by a, a musician for composing, and uh, you know that that it wouldn't have to go to. Uh, something like the Columbia Princeton to do electronic music. And in this time period for this, anyone who was a musician... This was in December of 1963. You were dealing with things like tape. Yes. You were dealing with things like speakers and microphones, maybe organs. an organ at both. Yes. <coughs> I, didn't, uh, I, I, I didn't bring along, but one of, one of my earliest pieces, which is one of my favorite pieces that I wrote, is a piece called uh, a Christmas Carol of 1963, uh, which is a piece of music. I will tell as long as I mentioned it. It's a piece of music which talks about the murdering of the four young girls in Montgomery, Alabama, in early 19, in the fall of 1963, while they were rehearsing for a Christmas play. And it's one of the you know, famous horrible stories. But I wrote the, this piece, and I wrote it using the melody Frere Jacques, because I was writing it for Brother Jack, John Kennedy. That's why I use that melody. And the piece, I will just tell you very quickly, the piece uh, was completed literally days before John Kennedy was assassinated. Days. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get into that. But it's <laughs> it's 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 we are talking about this, this time period. Here. The thing that you created together, a box yes. designed for you on commission, was a a sound generating music synthesizer yes. or sound creator. Yes. And, and we, we did work on that. Uh, we started seriously talking about that in January 64. And then we communicated back and forth, back and forth. And I went up to where Bob was working in the summer of 1964. And we worked and developed the instrument in, in about two weeks' time. Now I'm going to reel it back into Raymond Scott territory because this is our day today. The phone call is just after that instrument was shown to the public for the first time at the Audio Engineering Society in September. So just a few months later, Ray's very proud of Bob, a guy he's known since he was younger, is now becoming successful with a brand new product. It's not really even out there yet. Very few people even saw the Moog Sensor at that exhibit, but they're talking about future projects. And it's just nice to be able to listen in from the past and hear how they work. Um, Bob is a little better known publicly and you can find more YouTube videos of him. But they have different ways of speaking, they have different energy levels, and these are things you'll start to appreciate in the dynamic between these two guys we're gonna talk about today. say three words <laughs> and Ray was just freight training along with his ideas he's so full of a fountain of ideas as somebody said and yeah. a very important message about having someone steal something from you yeah, yeah. put it right away yeah you're mentioning you know we couldn't put things on paper we saw some of those before he writes a lot of things down he goes and then people throw those away so he was really trying to protect what he was doing as well too a little bit more of the phone call just to hear again their personalities come forth Bob is very grounded. He is that kind of person. He's quieter 
and he's very uh, functional. That's the way I would describe some of the things he liked to do. Um, and many times he just told people, I'm a tool maker. Uh, whereas Ray was an artist and a visionary and doing these things, Bob would like to bring you the perfect tool to do what you wanted to do. That was his goal. A little bit more clip of the phone call. It's sometimes hard to hear what they say, but you'll pick up bits of it. Futurama at the New York World's Fair, where you meet the future face to face. 
It's an experience you'll never forget because the fantastic Futurama ride takes you into the future and makes you feel like you're there in outer space, beneath the sea, in unbelievable places watching believable things happen. Many of the futuristic things you'll see are already more than just a part of the General Motors Futurama exhibit. They're demonstration models, in a sense, of scientific ideas being developed now. Stroll down our avenue of progress and see this kind of product on display. And also, the exciting array of new products in our product plaza. At the fair, see General Motors Futurama first. Take the trip that's worth the trip to the fair. It's free. So definitely very likely an early use of that synthesizer system. It is what it was designed for, this strange modulation. You're not trying to do flute sounds and bass sounds. You're trying to create new sounds. Absolutely. And absolutely the, uh, the, the, uh, on, on the whole idea, of course, was, was to create, create sounds in a totally different way. And that, that, that little uh, high frequency floating thing that's going was doing a lot more than Now this one is 1967, it's definitely the Moog synthesizer, and Herb will hear it, and you'll recognize this. Lightworks, which was a uh, makeup company, had Ray do this commercial, and you'll hear the melody from the Moog. with Raymond Scott. My first re reaction was, Raymond Scott? I know who that is. I, I you know, I, this was a long time ago. <laughs> I was brought up listening to Raymond Scott, and uh, you know, I, I, um, he said, why don't, you, uh, why don't you get together? And, and uh, when he told me where, where he was working at Three Willow Park, I, that was so close to my home, I did go over, called Raymond, made an appointment, said, and he said, yes, you can come over. And at that time, I had called, when I called him, I had already been teaching college. I had started teaching college four years before I met Raymond. And uh, Raymond was not at all impressed by that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of, the, one of the mistakes that a young man could have made <laughs> to go into rings. But, but he was a me. horn player. He though. did like me like right away. We did get a good relationship and it remained a good You have a jazz tradition. Yes, I have a jazz tradition. And I was certainly familiar with, with the, uh, the uh, quartet. What the about the toy the trumpet? trumpet yes. And the, to the, uh, the toy trumpet, uh, if I can take a, a couple of yeah, minutes. Yeah, come and demonstrate. Uh, I, I, was, um, I played the toy trumpet when I was probably uh, 12 years old. Uh, in junior high school, it's sometime in the 1940s, uh, <laughs> and uh, I've never, I've never, I've never seen the music of it since then. But I did play the trumpet solo, and uh, I thought, well, that might be fun if if I played a little of that tune. Um, we don't have a band here, but I'll uh, I'll, I'll just so uh, do it a little, little bit on the uh, mini bow. Uh, special thanks. 
for our attention. It seems to be the group brought us their original video. Very nice. Yeah, send it up and download it for it. Download it for it. And don't forget, it's very special. Herb is the first.